Okay. Um, well, Father, I just thank you for this opportunity um, just to hear your heart about uh, some very difficult things that are very confusing to your body and that you're not the author of confusion. And so I just thank you for clarity today, for your wisdom to just come forth. And um, we just give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Well, um, I chose to do my thesis on the, the case for women in ministry. Um, again, as we were doing our assignment, um, this just really leapt out at me. And there's a um, long history as I've been um, an associate pastor for 15 years, um, a single woman associate pastor. And um, that, well, I guess you could might as well say a divorced single woman as you know, my husband left me when I became a Christian because I became a Christian. So um, I faced my share of challenges, and this has always been a sticking point. Um, but it all started um, for me with this paper really uh, several years ago when this question was posed to me by three men in the foyer who cornered me a foyer, and they said, what makes you think you can be an associate pastor? The Bible says that women are supposed to be silent in the church. And it really shocked me and stunned me, and I was just kind of paralyzed for a few minutes because I was surprised that they cornered me, first of all, and I was surprised that they asked me that question. And uh, so after a minute, I just pointed to the pastor's office, and I said, go ask him. You know, he's the one who appointed me, and I'm under his authority. Uh, and I realized after they had asked me the question that I really didn't know how to answer that question. Um, and that verse that I'm referring to here, or they were referring to, about women being silent in the church, it was something that I always just kind of pushed underneath the, you know, pushed off to the side, didn't really try to deal with it, because I knew that God had called me to do what I was doing. And I knew that um, the heart of God wasn't against women. It wasn't against um, anybody, be, you know, because of the very things that Deb just shared about his heart towards us. But I never knew how to answer that question. And I really believe that there's a lot of people that are kind of in the same boat. You know, people who believe that God does use women and women who are being used by God, but they don't know what to do with that verse. So um, when we had this assignment, it really gripped my heart. And reading the things that some of um, the men were saying, it was just really difficult for me. And I, I felt this kind of righteous indignation rise up on the inside of me because I knew what they were saying was wrong. It was of the wrong spirit, but I didn't know how to answer that question. So that's why I chose to pursue this topic. Um, my thesis question was, is there indisputable biblical evidence beyond a reasonable doubt to justify barring women from serving in ministry. And so um, as I began to read books and research the subject and pray about it and ask the Lord about it, um, I realized that you know, the crux of the issue, most of all, has to do with the creation account and with those questionable scriptures um, in the Pauline epistles. Um, but there's got to be more to it than that. You know, you can't, there is no doctrine in the Bible that is taken from one or two scripture, scriptures and made a doctrine. Um, if you know of one, please tell me, but th it's the big picture. And so I really felt the Lord leading me to look at the big picture. Um, we've got to take all of the word of God when we look at issues like that and not just one or two scriptures pulled out of context. Um, there are theologians who have debated those scriptures. They've written about them. They've you know, exegetical this and the hermeneutics and everything. And there's still this huge divide in the church. So there's got to be something more because outside of a move of God on the hearts of people, arguing and debating those scriptures is never going to provide any answers. But looking at the big picture um, is a really important thing that we need to do in order to discover the heart of God. Um, beyond a reasonable doubt is a constitutional standard in criminal court of law that's required to convict. So in the Fifth Amendment, the founding fathers came up with this, um, this stipulation that if there's not, if there is reasonable doubt 
of this criminal or this defendant's guilt, then if there's any reasonable doubt at all, you can't convict him. You have to say not guilty because they went under the premise that it's better to let a guilty man go free than to convict an innocent man. Um, and that's just a standard of burden of proof that's required setting the church's standard be higher. If you think about the stakes that um, are, or well, what's at stake? 50% of the workforce of the kingdom of God is hanging in the balance, whether they are going to have their hands tied, tape over their mouth, push back in the corner, um, or are they going to be free to function? You know, does God really um, stifle somebody just because of their gender? So it's a really, really um, decisive issue on kingdom things. Okay, there are two different sides of the debate. I'm just going to kind of go over um, the, these points kind of quickly just because I don't have enough time to really go into detail, and then we can um, ask questions later and maybe discuss a few things. But basically, there's the traditionalist view, also known as a complementarian view or a hierarchical view. And basically what that view is, it comes from being passed down from patriarchal societies through time. There's a creational hierarchy that they believe exists where Adam was um, created first and he's the superior, Eve was created second, she's inferior and in a subordinate role to him. Um, she's the helper, which we'll talk about helper later. But, and that men are given the primary responsibility in creation. Um, men are born to be leaders. Women can only lead other women, and they can't have any authority over a man. So that's, um, oh, and they must be silent in the church because of those verses, that they're not allowed to take leadership roles, to speak authoritatively um, in a church setting. Now, they can do it outside of the church, but just not in the church. So um, that's basically the traditional view. Um, under certain circumstances, some of them can speak. And we're going to take a look at um, what one man, this Stanley Gundry, he used to be a traditionalist. He changed his mind as now an egalitarian, which is the other view we're going to talk about. Um, and this is what he had to say about it. Some instances are viewed as exceptions to the rule allowed by God because men didn't step up to the challenge or that women can prophesy, but just not have the office of the prophet, or women can teach, but not authoritatively, or women can teach and preach, but only with the permission of or under the authority of their husband or men in general. He says, these explanations strike me as contrived and desperate attempts to save the system and to preserve the benefits of male privilege that are built upon it. It's no wonder that hierarchicalists cannot agree among themselves on just what a woman may do and under what circumstances. The only thing that hierarchicalists agree on is that the, it's the men who get to tell the women what they can do. Um, he's speaking out of experience about the mindset of the traditionalist point of view in women. Now, the egalitarian view is the other side of the debate. Women and men are equals based on Galatians 3.28, that patriarchy was the result of the fall of man, and that Jesus redeemed mankind back to its original intent, that God calls and gives people according to his will, not according to their gender. And some of the biblical truths which support this stance include that women and men are made equally in God's image and likeness in Genesis 1.27. They're equally fallen. They're equally redeemable through Christ's life, death, and resurrection. There are equal participants in the new covenant community. They're equally heirs of God and Christ. And they are equally able to be filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit for life and ministry. So you can see that there's two distinct sides. Now, um, you can't just lump everybody. All the traditionalists are this way and all the or this way, it's a continuum, goes from liberal to conservative, but those are just the basic stances that each side hold. Um, like we said earlier, um, the creation account um, is a, one of the main issues, that there's a prescribed hierarchy that happened due to the fall of man, and we heard about that a little bit when we watched the Randall Cutter video, which had a huge impact on me. Um, as far as liberating my heart. Um, the troublesome Pauline verses that we're going to um, take
quick look at later. All right now, <laughs> it's later. <laughs> um, these are the three verses. Now, in my thesis, I didn't focus specifically on breaking down these verses in the main text of my thesis because um, I wanted to look at the issue outside of these three verses. But um, in an appendix, thank you, Nancy, <laughs> I was able to list some of the basic views there. And I'll just say, generally speaking, the egalitarians have um, points of argument on each of these verses, as do the traditionalists. Um, and so there are two sides to each of these stories, but they each have points of argument. So it's not cut and dried. Um, that egalitarians believe what traditionalists believe on each of these verses. So uh, as far as uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, um, burden of proof, there's arguments on both sides that could go either way. And many people on both sides of the argument see that, that there are, there are um, arguments that can be made. They just feel that their side has the better argument. Um, the views are deadlocked and the key is to view this issue in light of the big picture. So I asked a few questions. Um, what does the Bible reveal as a whole regarding the role of women? That's what we have to look at. We can't just pull those three verses out. So um, in regards to the creation account, there was the creation order. Um, Genesis 1, 26 to 28 talks about that. Um, it talks about woman being created as a helper. Now. If you remember back what, in that Randall Cutter video we watched, that word helper is azer, which is also used, um, I think it's 19 different times in the Old Testament. And out of those 19 times, I think it was 14 times it referred to God as a helper. All of the times when this word was used, it was never used as a subordinate who was like, you know, junior helping the, the top dog, the big kahuna. Um, it was always a helper from the place of strength. And so that's one of the main arguments that egalitarians have um, with the traditionalists who say women was created to be a helper subordinately to a man. Um, a traditionalist scholar states, I concede that these chapters taken on their own might not necessarily lead to a complementarian position. The information in them about gender roles is comparatively meager and susceptible to more than one interpretation. So that's a traditionalist scholar making that um, conclusion. Um, as far as the fall goes in Genesis 3.16, the traditionalists say this is a prescription of hierarchy. In other words, um, it's saying that God is prescribing man as being the top dog and women being superior, inferior. And again, um, I, you know, we all know what Randall Cutter had to say in that video, and he explained it really, really well. If you um, didn't get a chance to watch that, I really encourage you to, because you know he's a Greek scholar and a Hebrew scholar, and he really broke it down very well. Um, the egalitarians say it's descriptive of human behavior due to the curse. So the traditionalists say God is prescribing the roles of the hierarchy in the fall. But egalitarians say it's not a prescription. It's just a description of what the fall did to us as men and women. This is how we're going to act because of the fall. Um, and there was a very powerful um, thing that Randall broke it down the way he did, it really had an impact on me. Um, and this is Craig Blomberg. Again, he's a traditionalist. It says, God's word to the woman in 316 is thus not a prescription of how men and women should behave. It's a prediction that is, sadly, how they will often act. Neither is it um, the initial introduction of headship and submission into humanity. It's a description of its distortion due to sin. I never really looked at it that way for this study. I always had big question marks um, in my mind. So breaking it down into the Hebrew, which I wish we had time to talk more about it today, um, really makes it make more sense. So as far as the creation account goes, the conclusion 
and that I came to was that there is not sufficient evidence beyond a reasonable doubt to prove that a gender hierarchy is prescribed in the book of Genesis. Okay, so that's one, our first count. The next question to be addressed, are there examples of, in the Old Testament, of God using women in leadership roles and speaking on his behalf? So in other words, if there's, um, if God did prescribe these roles, in the creation, we wouldn't be able to find any example of women leaders in the Old Testament, if that's really what he wanted. So that's the next question. The first uh, woman that, were, that I looked at was Huldah. Now, she was a prophetess in the time of King Josiah, and there was a national crisis, and the king ordered his men to go out and to um, seek out a word from the Lord. Now, it was interesting that um, one of the things that I learned was uh, there was uh, Jeremiah and Zephaniah were both major prophets during that time, but in the time of a national crisis, they didn't go to them. They went to this woman prophetess. Um, she was married. Her husband wasn't the one in charge. It was her. And she delivered a powerful, hitting, um, directional word to an entire nation that caused this king to um, set forth his famous reforms and the whole nation was changed because of her word. She was a really powerful leader. Um, Miriam, there's some scripture references in which she's um, referred to. She was a prophetess. Um, Micah, he actually used her um, and referred to her in a prophecy as one of the leaders. When he talked about the team that led Israel out of Egypt, he didn't just say Moses, and he didn't just say Moses and Aaron. He said Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. She's included in the genealogies, and her death is specifically recorded um, in the Bible. And so that just shows of the esteem that they had for her in Jewish history as a leader. And then everybody knows the story of Deborah. Um, she also was married. Josephus talks about her husband being an esteemed man, but he wasn't the leader. And he, her husband, fell under her judicial authority. So um, not, not just you know all the other men, but also her husband. And that's one of the arguments that traditionalists has is that you know, women can't be an authority over men, but especially not their husbands. Um, so right there are three examples of women in the Old Testament who were leaders. Um, so the conclusion about question number two is that there's not sufficient evidence in the Old Testament beyond a reasonable doubt to show that God had prescribed a prohibition against women in leadership positions. The next um, section that I looked at was the Pauline writings or the Pauline epistles. And it goes back to the question that I had at the beginning, how do you deal with those troublesome verses? Because if you isolate them and read them on their own, you know, they are very troublesome to this issue. If you pull them out of context and just look at them, um, it would seem that women can't be leaders and women must be silent in the church. So the question that I asked here is, did Paul ever acknowledge women as Christian leaders in his writings? And if he did, then all the troubling passages must be viewed through the lens of Paul's inclusion of women. Um, so taking a look in the, um, in the Galate, or let me stop, sorry. Um, before we go on, Galatians 3.28, this is what it says. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all in one in Christ Jesus. Um, they say that Paul wrote this scripture before he wrote any of the troublesome verses um, that we find, those three major verses. So any interpretation of those verses needs to be laid against the background against this verse that says there's neither male or female because we're all one in Christ Jesus. That right there was something, a real powerful point to me, um, that he wrote that first. So um, back to the question, um, did Paul ever command or acknowledge women leaders? Um, there was Phoebe in Romans 16, 1 and 2. Um, she was described as a deacon, not a deaconess, because that word hadn't been invented yet because of the oppression against women, and women weren't leaders. Um, 
It's the same Greek word Paul used to describe his own works. So, and the works of Ty and Epaphras. So um, she was right up on the same plane as these men. And then there was Priscilla in Acts 18. It was Priscilla and Aquila, her husband. Um, they were the ones, if you remember, that um, taught Apollos, who was a powerful male apostle, a uh, you know, more accurate um, way in the scriptures. Now, um, Randall Cutter explained to us in his video that she was mentioned four out of six times in scripture she was mentioned first. Now, during the, in that culture, uh, we know that that was an affront to the culture, that the man was always mentioned first, um, but she was mentioned first four out of six times. And when I was studying this, one of the things that one of the scholars said was that you know, there, we don't want to think that there are biased um, opinions in the translations of the different, you know, translations of the Bible, but um, there was cultural bias to be found. Um, some translations read differently than others, and it all has to do with the background of the translators. Um, that's why a lot of people esteem the King James Version and say that it's more accurate because all of these modern translations, they say, you know, they kind of do their own thing and they're culturally biased. But there was something I discovered when I was looking at the Greek. I don't know how well you can see this. This is Acts 18.26 in the Interlinear Bible. Um, if you go through and the first few words of that middle section, it's where it mentions Priscilla and Aquila. And you can see in the Greek um, version of this Bible, it says Priscilla and Aquila, and I've got that blown up for you. Uh, even if you don't know Greek, you can tell, you know, the second word is an A, the first word, or the third word is an A, starts with an A, the first word starts with what's more similar looking to a P. So we can see this is one of those times when Priscilla and Aquila, um, when they're mentioned, she's mentioned first. But if you look at the King James, it says Aquila and Priscilla. So the translator switched the word order in that verse. And that's just an example of um, bias, because if you think back in the, was it 1620, the King James Version was translated, you know, that was still in a very strong patriarchal time. Um, and it just goes to show you how it's important to study the Greek words and the Greek translations of the Bible because um, there are bias um, translators. And it's easy for us to, when I was talking to my boss, who's a Mormon, she, she had a hard time wrapping her head around that because she thought that they were all inspired and they were inspired, but they weren't infallible. Um, and the Greek maybe, but not the translators um, who translate the Bible. So I thought that was rather fascinating. And then we all know about Junia, the, um, the female apostle. The actual trans, uh, translation in the Greek that um, Randall Cutter offered up was outstanding among the apostles. A lot of people try, the trans um, traditionalists try to flip this to make it translated as, you know, they were well known among the apostles or the apostles thought highly of them. But um, a lot of scholars agree that what this translated means, that they were outstanding among the apostles. Um, another verse I threw in there for all women, not just a specific woman, was in 1 Corinthians 11.5, where Paul lays down protocol for praying and prophesying for women. Um, if they were supposed to be silent in the church, why would he give them protocol about oral um, thing, praying out loud, prophesying out loud. How could prophesying not be considered authoritative speech, speaking by the power of the Spirit of God? So um, these are just some examples outside of those troublesome verses of Paul commending women or speaking to their, um, you know, the oratory that they're going to be given. So in answer to the question, because Paul commends women leaders in his writings and because of his direct reference to equality in Galatians 3.28, there is not sufficient evidence beyond a reasonable doubt to prove that women are not permitted to serve in leadership positions. All of the 
some scriptures in his writings must be interpreted in conjunction with the big picture. So now we're going to go to the star witness, who is Jesus. And I love this quote by this professor who said, the key to correct interpretation of the Spirit's intent is to measure the content of the epistles against the ultimate benchmark of Jesus' own attitudes and behavior to women. Um, so every, you know, traditionalists, egalitarians alike, everybody who has any sense at all knows that Jesus is the benchmark for our behavior. So looking at his example of how he treated women is one of the most important things that we can do when we're answering this question about women and leadership. Okay, here's a great quote that I loved I wanted to share with you. This is the cultural backdrop of the time that Jesus was functioning in the earth. Women weren't supposed to study the scriptures. One rabbi said it was better to burn a copy of the Torah than to give it to a woman. Another rabbi declared that teaching your daughter the Torah is like teaching her sexual immorality, and it was disreputable for a rabbi to speak to a woman in public. A rabbinic saying summed up the general attitude, at the birth of a boy, all are joyful, but at the birth of a girl, all are sad. And if you consider that this attitude, very chauvinistic, you know, very degrading to women, it, this is one of the things to answer the question ahead of time that really struck me the most. We don't have any clue in our culture today how radical Jesus was when it came to his treatment of women. Um, just thinking about the attitudes of the Pharisees and the other leaders that he he was coming against with this kind of attitude towards women, it really magnifies the awe that I have for how he treats women. And I, I wish we could go through um, all of the different things that I found, but um, he challenged the status quo by including women in his itinerant group. Uh, the um, respected father arrived in states that Junia was included in the 70 when they were sent out. Um, so she was actively in there uh, ministering to people when, when Jesus sent out the 70, which blows my mind. I, I never realized that. They were permitted to be his disciples. Um, the term sitting at the feet of Jesus is a term that describes a disciple sitting um, underneath his teacher. It's not just a position she took on the floor because all the chairs were taken. That was had some meaning. His first declaration of his messiahship was to a woman, and she became the first evangelist. He had never disclosed and actually confessed himself as Messiah until it was to the Samaritan woman at the well. And then she went out preaching. When she brought back the men um, that she had preached to, he didn't rebuke her for preaching, and he didn't rebuke them for having a woman preach to them. Um, totally radical. The Gospels concur that Jesus appeared first to women after his resurrection, and he instructed them to go preach the resurrection to the male apostles. Um, that was on purpose, you guys. He, they, he could have appeared to anyone at any time, at any place he wanted to. But he, he, there was an intention, and it was a statement that he made when he appeared to those women first and sent them to go to the apostles. The testimony of a woman wasn't worth anything in those days, except for to Jesus. He valued it so much, and it's recorded throughout all history that they were the first ones that got to see him and, and got to go preach um, his resurrection. To me, that just really strikes me. Another great quote, there's solid historical evidence for the claim that Jesus clearly rejected the prejudice against women that was so widespread in his day. In encounter after encounter, Jesus treated women as equals. The conclusion seemed obvious to me. If the one I confessed as God incarnate lived and taught the equality of women, I had better do the same. This was a man who used to be um, an egalitarian, and he was changed to or a traditionalist and he changed to egalitarian. Am I echoing? Uh, no, no. Okay, okay. I, I'm not sure. So the conclusion is 
There's absolutely no evidence prescribing limitations on women, that not even one. On the contrary, there's overwhelming evidence of him including them and expanding their freedom um, in the presence of God. I, I couldn't find one instance where he pr oppressed women. And so, oh goodness, time flies when you're having fun. Okay. Um, star witness number two is the Holy Spirit. Women were in the upper room. They all spoke with tongues. Why would he pour himself out um, on them, empower them to speak, to prophesy, if he was going to say, okay, well, that was fun. Now shut up for the rest of the church age. <laughs> um, it's just overwhelming evidence. There's not sufficient evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that women were excluded from functioning in the Holy Spirit power in the New Testament church. Rather, there's overwhelming evidence that he empowered them to speak. So in conclusion, I almost got it. <laughs> Gamaliel, Paul's former instructor, gives wise counsel to the Pharisees when they were seeking to kill the apostles for preaching the gospel. The church would be wise to heed his inspired words when considering women in ministry. And now I say to you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if the, this counsel or this work be of men, it'll come to naught. But if it be of God, you can't overthrow it, lest haply you be found even fighting against God. So I submit to you in conclusion of this study, even though there's a raging debate about whether or not women should be leaders, whether they should be in ministry, there is not evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that that's what the intention and the heart of God is. So instead of trying to silence them, step back, take your hands off of it, let women do what they feel they're called to do, and let God be the judge of it. But I fear for the people who are oppressing women because if I were the devil and I had a chance to cut God's workforce in half, this would be a good way to do it. Very good. Very good. Let me just... Um.